What's up, everybody? Welcome in to something we've been waiting for. A major decision has been made in the Menendez brothers case. Not the final decision, but a very major decision. And we're going to talk about what exactly it means and how we got here. Because it's unusual to get to this spot, especially when it seems like there is still division and there are still hurdles that need to be crossed. And is it time for the family to celebrate? Is it time for the people who think they should stay in forever to say they've lost and it's over? Let's discuss that. Let's discuss the process. Let's discuss what it means. And hopefully we'll answer a lot of your questions. Leave them in the comments, hit the like button, and make sure you subscribe to our channel. So we had heard rumblings, a decision was going to be made by the end of this week. We heard rumblings of the family being cautiously optimistic. We watched the statements made by, and it, it's interesting to call them the family. It's such an unusual case because it's a family affair. Two sons take the lives of their mother and father, and the majority of the family is behind the two sons to say they should get out, to say that either they were not guilty or it should have been manslaughter or something lesser. All of those are important factors. They should get a new trial because there's new evidence or they should get resentenced because they've been rehabilitated and they can go back out into the community and be productive members of society and safe members of society. Two different arguments that their lawyer explained to us in the last press conference. Well, this is route number two, the resentencing route where this decision is being made. This is not, here's a new trial because this new evidence, we're going to redo it all. Maybe they're not guilty all, all the way around. That's not what's happening today. This is a discussion on resentencing. And what are they going to resentence them to? What are they going to resentence them for? What does the state attorney's office believe happened to the Menendez brothers? What do they believe they are guilty of? What do they believe the punishment should be? All of that's going to be really important as we walk through today, the process of how we got here, what's coming next, and what we expect to actually see happen to the Menendez brothers and when, okay? So a lot of things going on, a lot of information we're going to learn in just about 15 or 20 minutes of video that we're going to watch here together, some clips, his explanation, and then him answer some questions. I don't speak Spanish, so we're going to skip the Spanish part. He does speak in Spanish for all you Spanish speakers out there that want to watch the full press conference. You'll get more out of it than I did, um, but plenty of it we can get through today and break down what it actually means. So let's get to it here who is the deputy district attorney in charge of the resentencing unit. Let me begin by telling you that this is a, a case uh, where we've had many people in this office spend a great deal of time uh, reviewing the case. I have to tell you unequivocally that we don't have a universal agreement. Uh, a lot of people in the office worked on it and they don't have universal agreement. Now, that happens in offices. It ha happens in my office once in a while, right? Where all the lawyers don't exactly agree on what we should do in a case. There's got to be a final decision maker, obviously. Um, and in this case, it's it's him. But it is interesting that they don't have consensus when they're all kind of coming from the same side. They're all prosecutors. None of them that I know of were there to actually prosecute this case. I shouldn't say that because actually I don't know. I guess there could be prosecutors that have been there for 30, 40 years. Um, but it's interesting to me that they don't have consensus and that he's making sure the public knows. There's a couple reasons for that. Number one, just being honest, right? And transparent with the public. But number two, if there are members of the public that absolutely believe in the Menendez brothers' guilt, their danger, and that they should stay in prison for the rest of their life, you have an advocate in the DA's office. You have somebody fighting for your voice and they're not done fighting. So I think it's kind of good public expression as well from him. I'm not going to say it's about politics, right? But that question is coming later. Uh, there are people in the office uh, that strongly believe that the Menendez brothers should stay in prison the rest of their life. And they do not believe that they were molested. And there are people in the office that strongly believe that they should be released immediately and that they were in fact molested. I have to tell you that after a very careful review of all the arguments that were made for people on both sides of this uh, equation, I came to a place where I believe that under the law, resentencing is appropriate, and I am going to recommend that to a court tomorrow. 
So that is the major decision. He is going to recommend to the court, and these words are very important. He is going to recommend to the court resentencing, okay? What he didn't say is they're not guilty. They should be absolved from all of this. We'll take it all away. What happened to them was horrible. It was a justified killing. He didn't say that, right? And he also didn't say, I have made the decision to release them. I am going to tell the court it's over. We're pulling charges or dismissing charges. Let's let them out. Certain things he could have done to potentially just dismiss the charges to say we were wrong and they have to go home tomorrow, right? There are certain things he could have done, maybe not tomorrow, but there are certain things he could have done to push harder for that or make sure that something like that happens. And that's not where we're at. I didn't expect him to do that. I don't fault him to do that. What he's doing takes cojones and what he's doing is the right thing that he believes after looking at the case. And so I respect him for that. I'm just saying some people are like, oh, they're going to be out tomorrow. That's not what's happening. And also when he uses words like I'm going to recommend to the court, that lets you know there are other people that still have to make decisions, that he is not the final decision maker. This is potentially the biggest step because when you get the state attorney's office or the district attorney's office on your side in a situation like this, that's the number one key. If you're the lawyer for the Menendezes and the victims and everybody's now on the same side, the defendants, the victim's family, and the district attorney's office is going to be hard for a judge to say no to that, but he is going to recommend it to the court. And, and that's a big step, but we still have more steps to go before they are released. What that means in this particular case is that we're going to recommend to the court that the life without the possibility of parole be removed and that they will be sentenced for murder which because there are two murders involved, that will be 50 years to life. However, because of their age under the law, since they were under 26 years of age, at the time that these crimes occurred, they will be eligible for parole immediately. Okay. A lot came out right there, right? First off, he thinks the life without parole should be removed. That's part of the resentencing. And he's going to talk about how much they do that in this district later. But he said they should be resentenced under murder. The big M, the capital M, first degree. Not an involuntary manslaughter, not even a manslaughter type of count. I don't know what it's all called in California exactly but not one of the lesser included crimes, but the top dog, biggest, worst crime you can be convicted of. That is what he thinks they should be sentenced under. That was a big deal to me. That was a surprise to me, right? And I think it was a smart legal decision because you're not entering the province of the jury and changing their verdict. You're not saying the jury got it wrong when they convicted them of M. It should have been manslaughter. And so we're going to now take it out and make it manslaughter, sentence them under manslaughter. That's not what he's saying. They're going to sentence them under exactly what the jury convicted them of, almost ratifying that conviction and that they are in fact guilty for that. And he's going to talk about more about how the abuse, he believes it happened, but it is not an excuse for what they did. And I think that's really important for public perception because a lot of people do have a problem with just saying, oh, let's let them out. Let's change the jury's verdict. Let's do this or that. He's not doing that. He's using the legal tools and rules at his exposure to resentence them to 50 years because there was two, two crimes, 50 to life. So it's not life without parole. So I guess technically he's changing what the jury did there, but he's saying the statutes in place to allow resentencing and the rules in place to allow resentencing allow you to go to 50 to life. They've already served, what, 25 to 30 years. So once you get to this point, because they were under the age of 26, this is stuff that's already in place because they were under the age of 26, they have the opportunity now to be released immediately. What do those words mean? The opportunity to be released immediately. Immediately does not mean tomorrow, even though it says immediately. So not literally immediately, but the opportunity to be released means there are still more hurdles to clear. We've got the judge. We already talked about the judge, right? So they got through the victim's family. They got through, or the, the defendants want to get released. The victim's family, they got through that hurdle. Now they got through the DA's office. Next comes the judge. And last is the parole board. 
So just because they have the opportunity to be released immediately does not mean they'll be released immediately. And they're going to be sentenced under murder 50 years to life. I found that to be very interesting. And I actually think it's a pretty good public play, PR play, to keep them under that statute and that conviction while also giving them the opportunity to be released immediately. And we're going to talk about now in the video what needs to happen for them to be released immediately. But that was really important. And I wanted to highlight exactly what he said there. The teams that have worked on this, on the resentencing side of it, have spent literally probably hundreds of hours by now looking at this case. These cases were originally presented on the heaviest side of it, which I'll explain in a moment what that is, last year. And then the request for a prosecutor-initiated resentencing occurred earlier this year. And there have been people in this office working in these cases from the very beginning, as well as many other cases that we have. The reason why I'm here today and why I came in front of all of you about 10 days ago is because there was a more recent documentary about the case. So he's literally saying now, He's about to get into the fact that this most recent documentary, and I don't know which one he's talking about. I assume the drama series on Netflix. Maybe it's the documentary that came after. But he's literally saying, I came to you 10 days ago and I'm coming to you now. And he's about to get into the fact that this happened now. It was sped up because of public pressure. Not, not necessarily pressure. Because of public interest. Public interest matters. Your voice matters. Right? I know people feel like it doesn't. And sometimes... It does feel that way in life, right? I get it. I feel that same way. But I like to highlight when it does matter. And when enough people get together and say, this is our society and we're the people, we're the public, and this is a problem and we rise up, it literally is going to talk about they got so many requests that they couldn't possibly keep processing them. So they decided to move it up, handle it as quickly as possible with all the requests they've gotten. And we're riding forward together as a public servant with what the public wants. Now, that can be dangerous. The public goes wild. But I just, I, I found it interesting that he literally highlighted that and he's going to explain what he means here. That again brought a tremendous amount of public attention. And we know there have been other documentaries. So this is not the first, this is the more recent one. And frankly, our office got flooded with requests or information. And even though this case was already scheduled to be heard in late November, I decided to move this forward because, quite frankly, we did not have enough resources to handle all the requests. And one of the things that I thrive to do in this office is to be very transparent in everything that we do. In this case, he moved it up because of the number of requests and be mentioning multiple documentaries. I mean, that's it's pretty mind-blowing for me. Even if it's true and that happens, a lot of times they don't admit it. We review the prison files. And you have to understand that the way the process works, when you're talking about a sentence and resentencing under the law, it really focuses not necessarily on what the original crimes were, but it focuses on, has the person been rehabilitated, number one, and number two, can they be released safely into the community? So he talks about, doesn't matter how heinous the crime is, I don't necessarily know if I agree with that. I think the heinousness of the crime does matter, and it definitely matters to the parole board. Um, but he's like, we look at what they've done since then. And he, you're going to hear him parrot now, and I'm not faulting him for parroting it. I'm going to give props to Garagos the lawyer for uh, the Menendez is he is going to parrot almost exactly what Garrigo said in the prior press conference, which means that's good lawyering. If you're pushing your narrative and your theme and your angle and what you believe to be true and what you believe the evidence pushes to, it's just like when I say jurors, when they get interviewed after the trial, if they're parroting what one lawyer said, that's a home run. Well, now the DA was his jury. The DA was his decision maker and the DA is now saying exactly what he was saying in the press conference. So he's provided that 
evidence. He's provided a booklet. He's provided how they've been rehabilitated, how they won't reoffend, how they are safe in the community from officers in the jail to other inmates, to people that they've helped on the outside. And now this DA is going to say almost the same exact thing Garrigo said, which is how you know he's winning and he's pushing the ball forward to accomplish their goal. Under that rubric, since I've been in office, we have resentenced over 300 people. Wow. Including 28 for murder. I was shocked to hear that. I was shocked to hear that. I don't really know how I feel about that. Um, I hope it's a very, when you hear this, right, even if you want somebody released, when you hear that, you want it to be a difficult process. So they're going to put out 28 people that have been convicted of that back out into society, 300 people total that they've resentenced. And usually resentencing means lessening your sentence, not making it worse. That's a little scary, but also the number that he's going to say and the recidivism rate of the 300 that they released is way lower than the societal norms for recidivism reoffending. So a little scary, but also good redemption, rehabilitation, what we should want. We should want it to be a rigorous process that's very difficult to happen, not something that you can just snap your fingers and let's resent this person. Only four have reoffended. If that was a regular recidivism rate in this country, we would be the safest nation in the world. But we know that it's not. In fact, somewhere between 40 and 50% of the people that go to prison reoffend and get rearrested. I have heard that number's over 50%, but I'll trust his number since he does a lot of resentencing work. But out of 300, only four. I think he meant out of 300, only four, and not out of 28, only four. But 300, only four reoffend. Some people will say that's four too many. Um, but again, it, this is part of the process that's hard to balance people that have been rehabilitated, that maybe were sentenced too harshly, that maybe rules do change, that maybe because of their age and different reasons you let them out. And only four reoffending out of 300 is a much better rate than 50% of just normal people that get out after serving their sentence or after being in and then out after a short sentence already or serving a longer sentence, whatever it may be, 50% of them reoffend, which are not good numbers for our prison system when talking about rehabilitation. But it's interesting. They've done a lot of resentencing, which I think is important. That's not just famous people. It's not just people they do documentaries about. 300 people have already been resentenced since he's been there, I believe is what he said. And that's why we have so many problems. However, when you look at the case of the Menendez brothers, you see two very young people. One was 19 and the other one was 21 when they committed this horrible acts. And I want to underline they were horrible acts. There is no excuse for murder. And I will never imply that what we're doing here is to excuse that behavior. Because even if you get abuse, the right path is to call the police, seek help. But I understand also how sometimes people get desperate. We often see women, for instance, that have been battered for years and sometimes they will murder their abuser out of desperation. And I do believe that the brothers were subjected to a tremendous amount of dysfunction in the home and molestation. But they went to prison for life without the possibility of parole, which meant... So before he gets into exactly what Garrigo said, sorry, I, I jumped the gun a little bit. This is when he's going to basically parrot what Garrigo said, the, the Menendez brothers' attorney. Um, I, I'm, I appreciate that he said that. It's not an excuse. This isn't what we're telling you you should do. Um, yes, they were abused. I fully believe they were abused. That's what he said, which I think is interesting because he knows a lot more than the general public does, right? He's seen a lot more than we have, although I feel like we have seen a lot in this case. And that's kind of where I leaned too, is that I do believe the abuse was there. I was kind of saying if I was on the jury, I think I would have voted for manslaughter, which again, could have ended up in a similar sentence range to what they've already served. Um, not that they were innocent or that it should have been not guilty because of some kind of self-defense, but he said he believes they were guilty of M the big crime, even though they were abused. And I think that's important, especially as a prosecutor, to lay it out there so people cannot mince words and they understand exactly where you're coming from. There's certainly under the law at that time, they had no hopes of ever getting out. They could have done what many other people do, which is basically said, you know what? I'm here for the rest of my life. So I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to misbehave. I'm going to join gangs. Uh, I'm going to live the life of a person. But they never did that. 
To the contrary, even though they didn't think that they would ever be let free, they engaged in a different journey, the journey of redemption and the journey of rehabilitation. And often the people that begin their journey of rehabilitation and redemption in prison is often very internal. And what they do, and, and one of our lawyers pointed out this today, is usually the path is people try to further their education, do things for self-improvement, which the brothers have done, by the way. But it's more unique or more less usual, I guess, when people not only do that, but they also begin to engage in ways to make life for others better. And in this case, the brothers have been doing so for a very long time, creating groups to deal with how to address untreated trauma, creating groups to deal with other inmates that have physical disabilities and may be treated differently. Even in one case, Lyle negotiating for other inmates as to the conditions that they live under during prison. And all this was done by two young people. Now they're not as young. They had no hopes of ever getting out of prison. They have been in prison for nearly 30. That's like exactly what Garrigo said. So explaining their rehabilitation, how good they've done with no hope of getting out. So purely out of just whatever was good inside of them, because they could have gone whatever way they wanted to. They could have just sat and read books and talked to nobody, right? They could have just been horrible inmates or just stay to themselves inmates and wait to die, but they didn't. They took the opportunity in the worst of situations to do the best of things. And so you take that and you apply it to society. How will they act? What will they do? How will they be? That's the question. 35 years. They have been in prison for nearly 35 years. I believe that they have paid their debt to society. And the system provides a vehicle for their case to be reviewed by a parole board. And if the parole concurs with my assessment, and it will be their decision, they will be released accordingly. So that doesn't mean it's going to happen. That means it's going to go potentially before the parole board. And I would assume the judge is going to say yes, and that's fine. And we let the parole board do their job. This is what they do. They look, they see if people have rehabilitated, they see if they'll be a dangerous society. If they will, they'll send them back. So what can the parole board do? Well, they can release them and say they agree, or they can send them back and say, you got to come back later. Or they can just keep sending them back and end up, they go to prison for life and they die in prison. That's a possibility as well. Now, to try to give you an idea of how the parole board works, if you have a criminal defense attorney, they'll be on one side, right, of whether they should get out, right? The lawyer that represents Menendez is like, obviously they should get out. Well, if you look at the DA, they're usually on the opposite side saying, no, they should stay in forever. They've been convicted. Our office prosecuted these crimes and convicted them to keep society safe. So if the person all the way on that side has now come over, crossed the line and said, they should get out. We feel like they've paid their debt to society. The parole board's going to take that into account. The parole board takes the DA's recommendation, recommendation very seriously. Potentially the most serious thing you can have is cooperation or agreement from the DA. So the parole board would be kind of in the middle, maybe a little towards the DA side compared to the defense attorney side. So if you have somebody way further out than the parole board already agreeing, chances are the parole board's going to agree. That would be my guess as to what happens in this case. So while all hurdles have not been cleared, the biggest and most difficult hurdle is getting this office on board, and that has happened. So I expect they will be released, and soon. I do. I really expect that. It's not done. It's not a done deal. They're not released. The celebration is not finalized here for the people that want this, right, which I know is not everybody. 
Legally speaking, I think exactly how he explained it makes sense. Still keep the big conviction, 50 to life, but we have lawyers like Garagos who look at it. We have the DA's entire office that looked at it. We have the public that's been looking at it. We're going to have a judge look at it, and we're going to have the parole board look at it. So that will hopefully give more confidence in their safety and being sent to the community. And I know everybody's not going to agree with that, and that's perfectly fine. Make your voice heard. I just talked about off the top how the public has a voice, and it's very important to make your voice heard when the opportunity arises. I must underline, however, this case will be filed in court tomorrow. The final decision will be made by the judge. The court has to agree with my conclusion that they deserve to be resentenced. It is very possible that they may be members of this office that will be present in court opposing their resentencing. So not only is there division in the office, but the people that oppose the resentencing are also going to show up to court and argue to the judge. That's a little wrench thrown in, right? That's a big wrench. I said little, but that's a big wrench. Because if they make good arguments to the judge, and the judge is like, no, I'm not going to agree. Because we've got a couple people in the district attorney's office that make really good arguments why they should stay in prison forever. So that's what makes me give a little bit of pause to my prior comments. And they have a right to do so. And we encourage those that disagree with us to speak. And the court is the appropriate place to do it. I appreciate that, right? I appreciate that. He's not stifling them. We certainly feel very, we're very sure <clears throat> Not only that the brothers have rehabilitated and that they will be safe to be reintegrated in our society, but that they have paid their dues, not only for the crimes that they committed, but because of all the other things they have done to improve the life of so many others. So, again, he said they're sure, right? That's strong words coming from a prosecutor. We will be filing for resentencing tomorrow. We're seeking that they would be sentenced to life with the possibility of parole, as opposed to life without the possibility of parole, which is there currently have. That means that they would have 50 years to life because there were two murders. But because of the age upon which they were convicted under 26, under current law, that means they're eligible for youthful parole. I think there is also important. So then he goes into how the abuse can happen to boys too, and how things have changed and times have changed. The uh, victims, family members also speak out how they're in support again, which we heard a lot of in the prior co press conference, but I wanted to get to a couple questions um, that was asked. And one of the lead prosecutors that was uh, looking into this was not just him. Who's the actual DA, but she gets up and answers some questions too. And I thought she had some really good insight about the process and how all this works um, going forward. So I thought this was a good learning experience for us as well. So what we'll do is we, we'll file our... Say your name Identify your name yourself, your please. My name is Nancy Theberge. I'm the deputy in charge of the resentencing unit. This is Brock Lunsford, assistant head deputy of the post-conviction litigation division. So what will happen is tomorrow we will file the actual petition requesting resentencing with the legal arguments and uh, accompanying exhibits as to why we think it's appropriate. It's just a filing. No one's going to physically be in the courtroom. Um, from there, we'll also serve the defense with our motion and our paperwork so that they'll have their copies. And from there, we will coordinate with the defense to set up a court date with the court so that the petition can be heard. Now, whether or not that's a setting or a hearing will be decided between us and the defense and the court um, once everybody gets an idea of what we filed. Then from there at the hearing, the defense can either decide to have the defendants, uh, the Menendez brothers, physically brought into court. They can ask that the individuals appear by video or audio WebEx, a, kind of a Zoom participation, which we all kind of adapted to because of COVID. And then from there, we will do the hearing and um, submit all the written and legal and oral arguments and any evidence that needs to be admitted at the time. And then the court will rule at that point. But we
perfect explanation, right? About what we can see, what we can expect, how it's going to work, still legal work to be done, arguments to be made, documents to be presented. We don't have that court date yet because we're just starting the process tomorrow, but it's our intention to have that go forward before the habeas, because if the judge grants it, that may impact the defense's decision to proceed on the habeas. Meaning if they win and they get the resentencing and the parole board's going to let them out, maybe they'll just withdraw the habeas and they won't go for a new trial based on the newly discovered evidence. That's what, when they say the habeas, that's what they mean. So um, we're going we're gonna to try it just as a matter of economy of time. To, to stack it when I, one before the other. Now, have the brothers found out about this in real time or were they told about this beforehand or what was their reaction that they were? No, this was... No, this is, uh, actually, the family was only invited to come. They were not aware what the final decision was until a few minutes ago. Uh, the brothers may be actually seeing you guys on TV or social media, but no, no one knew other than a very small number of people in this office. And by the way, I should tell you that actually the final decision was just made about an hour ago. Pretty wild. That's pretty wild. It like just happened right before they came to press conference. Obviously, I think he knew which way he was leaning, but this is, I mean, we're kind of seeing history, I feel like. You know, we're watching and living history together. I, I posted on Twitter that the legal cycle right now is is just bonkers. And I feel like that's true. Like so many huge things are happening that are such an opportunity to learn about the American justice system. Judge rules. If the judge rules in favor. Right. Then it goes back to it goes back to the prison system, and then it, the parole system takes over that. That's and is there, would there be a parole or probationary period where they have to live in a halfway house, or simply be released? If they're allowed to be released. You know, those, those are really completely entirely up to the parole board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A place. There's a lot of options for the parole board, and we're just going to have to wait and see. But this is a huge step to get there, right? So we'll keep following it to see if and when they get out, how they get out, what are the uh, parameters. And I'm sure they're going to be doing stuff in the media to thank the public and become a part of it and tell their story, I'm sure. Um, so I, I think that's something that still remains to be seen. We'll yeah, try. You had what was you the fact that the... made the final decision? You said the final decision was just made. Was it the letter? Was it the Menudo confession? What was it that put you over the top to make? No, it? what it was is I was evaluating the arguments that were being made within my office, both pro and against the release. Yeah, can I ask you? Uh, you hold on, I had, had it. A lot of I had it. Calls from yeah. Yeah, yes, I, I'm, you know, you have made resentencing a cornerstone of your tenure as district attorney here in Los Angeles. There are some people who have accused you of using this very, very highly publicized, clearly case to use it for politics, given how close we are to the election. What's your response to people who have been making that claim? There's nothing political about this. We have resentenced over 300 people, including 28 for murder. Um, and we will continue to resentence people in the future. Um, and that's all I can tell you. But do you have a question? But yes, how sir. Is your bid Excuse me, please. You're 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 interrupting. Everyone's interrupting. I'm just no. wondering how you're being real life. Yes, please. Thank yes. You. Could the brothers be home by Thanksgiving? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> why didn't? Why did you? It sounded like no, based on the other um, attorney's timeline that spoke thirty to forty-five days. You decide not to go with the volunteer uh, reduced voluntary manslaughter. That was part of the 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 uh, the process that I was still going through up until a couple of hours ago. I don't believe that a that a manslaughter would have been the appropriate charge given the premeditation that was involved in the murders. Um, I believe that this were clearly murders that were premeditated. Now the motivation that's where you know differences of opinion come up, but I don't think it would be appropriate to go all the way down to manslaughter. Yeah, yes, man. Did you hear that? That was really important. He thought the presentation, there was absolutely enough evidence to convict him of the murders. He did not think it would be appropriate to go down to manslaughter. I found, I mean, this has just been so revealing to me about what this process was like. And it's wild that this can happen. It's sad for so many people that want something like this to happen and they can't get the attention of the DA's office. But very interesting at the decision-making process, what they can go through and how it can come out when they really believe something is too harsh. And this is what we should do. If we think a change is necessary for justice, we need to make that change.
ease of those. Since you're obviously supporting the push for release here, how would that work with people from uh, post litigation and sentencing? Would they go before the parole board to argue for their release? No, no. We have a policy that we only send victim services advocate. So the, the question was, are you guys going to all go there to the parole board and argue as the DA's office? as attorneys to let these kids out or let, I should say these kids, obviously let the Menez, Menendez brothers out. And he's like, no, we don't send lawyers. No, no. We have a policy that we only send victim services advocate. If the victim or the victim's family wants that support, we don't send lawyers to our parole boards to relitigate a case. The parole board is fully aware of what the initial crime was, the, the, the crime that led to the conviction. Their work is primarily to evaluate whether they're rehabilitated and safe to be released, and that will be the way here. Can you break down the timeline for us? Can we expect a hearing by the end of the year? Or do you know when we might get yeah, something on the books? Um, I'm hoping to get it on calendar, depending on the defense preparedness. Um, I'd like to see it go to hearing probably within the next 30 to 45 days at the most. My guess is the defense is going to be prepared and they're going to be ready to go tomorrow. Like you tell them they're going to be ready because. That's their job to get these boys out. I keep calling them these boys and these kids because I'm, again, I'm remembering the drama in the documentary to get the Menendez brothers out ASAP. But if the hearing is not going to happen for 30 to 45 days, highly unlikely they're going to get out by Thanksgiving. But it's crazy that it's possible before the end of the year that they could be out. It's crazy. I wouldn't bet on the process moving that quickly, but it does seem like it's moving in that direction. Just, I mean, we're not, there's not much to argue because we're... Kind of a question. Okay. There's one, one more question, please. But related to the case, not to elections. If you want to talk about elections, related we'll do that. Yes, sir. What would you like to say right now to Eric and Lyle Menendez? What we like to say to them, and it's we, because it's not a, you know, I've made the final decision, obviously, but we have a whole team that worked on it. Uh, we have a family here that wants to be reunited. Is that, um, we appreciate what they did while they were in prison. While I disapprove of the way they handle their abuse, um, we hope that they not only have learned, which appears that they have, but that if they get reintegrated into our community, that they continue to do public good. No, thank you so much, thank everyone. You. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, so that's it. Big win for the Menendez brothers. We'll see if they clear the last two hurdles of the judge and the parole board and how quickly they can do that. Let me know what you think about it. And I understand if you disagree, it's a totally safe place to discuss it respectfully. Um, and I'm going to look through these comments. I can't wait to see what you guys all think. Please hit that like button. Thanks for joining me. Till next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out the Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, the lawyer you know.